Well, good morning. Good morning. All right. What a beautiful place, huh? Couldn't believe it when I was driving here yesterday. Wow. What if you've never been here before? Um, I want to talk to you about something that's really exciting that's going to really impact all of us, whether you're a developer, part of a small company, part of a big company, uh, whatever you are, in the next few years, 5G is going to impact you personally uh, and your business. And I want to talk about, so w what does it mean, this, this era of 5G, and where does open source come into this? Um, let me start by, um, this is probably a slide, you, you've seen it before, just to give you an idea of, of how this, this story of going to software and open source started for us at AT&T about four or five years ago. Um, when, when we deployed the iPhone in 2007, in the first 10 years of the deployment of the iPhone, our traffic increased by 360,000%. Um, majority of our traffic, to actually more than 50% of our traffic today, is video. The traffic certainly has changed quite dramatically. And every day we carry, this is data as of February 2019, we carry 242 petabytes of data daily, huge amount of data. And we saw that coming a few years ago, and what we did about this is to start really disaggregating our network into a control layer and, and a data layer. We started sort of moving sort of the software and the hardware and trying to understand how to use software not just to scale our network more efficiently, but to program our network. So we started building this platform that called Ecom, and three, four years later, we worked with Jim and ARPIT and decided, you know what, we want to partner with the Linux Foundation, partner with a number of companies, China Mobile and many other vendors, to really put that into open source. And today, it's, uh, we have a very thriving ONAP um, uh, ecosystem of over 100 companies under the Linux Foundation networking umbrella. This has really helped us significantly today at AT&T. We've deployed ONAP. This is an open source. We've deployed it at AT&T. And we've actually, um, by the end of 2018, we passed 65% of our network being virtualized. Our target network at AT&T, 65% virtualized today, managed by this orchestration platform. This is great. So what's next? Well, we're starting to see big shifts. We're starting to see a shift also, not in just in our traffic, but in the devices. We're going to more smartphone devices, and we're expected to have an explosion of IoT devices. Or explosion, you know, due to the 5G, an explosion of the M2M and the M2X. What this means is that that little device that you probably have in your house, it could be a toothbrush or whatever, will probably have the intelligence of your smartphone today. That couple of dollars, maybe a dollar. Even we are talking about, well, if that toothbrush has the, smart, the smartness of your smartphone today, can it collect data and send that data to your dentist if they're, you know, to tell them whether there's something wrong with your teeth or they have cavities, et cetera? We're not far away from that. We're actually two, three years away from that. With 5G basically coming in, it's, it's all going to be basically possible. So there's an explosion shift in the types of devices and the number of devices that are going to be, that we will have to connect in the network. And the current approach that we have today is really not going to scale to allow us to support that. The type of data is also changing. Um, we started many years ago with just text, and that's gone to voice to images, to video, and with 5G, we're expecting a huge part of the traffic is going to be virtual reality, augmented reality, video 360, et cetera. Starting from text, this data explosion is about 50,000 times. And that 50,000 times is not something you can grow a network by 50,000 times just in a span of about 10, 15 years. So we're starting to look at that and say, well, how is the network going to support this change, this explosion of data, and the shift in the devices and the data. Most of you have seen the evolution of the network, OK? 1G, you can support you know, 2 to 4 kilohertz, uh, kilobits per second. You know, we use that to, it's analog. We can basically transmit voice with that. 
Then we went to 2G, and with 2G, now you've gone into not just voice, you can actually do some rudimentary data. Now you can have 10 to probably 14 kilobits per second, and now you can start some, doing some, some rudimentary texting and voice. And then you go to, um, um, you go to um, uh, 3G, and in 3G, um, we started seeing sort of a movement from uh, voice and data to doing more data than we've ever done before. Um, we can probably support something like uh, two, three megabits uh, per second of data. But really, the big revolution really happened with 4G. And that data became video. And that really gave birth to a lot of companies that are even in existence today. We would never be able to do streaming video as one example if it wasn't a 4G and LTE. And I think what you're seeing in the 5G, this is really a paradigm shift. And this is why 5G is so important. Because when you really put together 5G and what we heard earlier today about edge compute, you put that smartness at the edge and you increase the speed of the access, really what you end up with a real-time network. What does that mean? A real-time network means that you can now do the compute, the intelligence, the processing in the network just as fast as you can have it in the device. You have an enormous, large amount of intelligence sitting just at your fingertips, wherever you are. And that's why this is really a big deal. Um, 5G sort of allow us to operate at spectrum, and we've talked about millimeter wave spectrum. What does that mean is that you're now operating at spectrum about 24 uh, gigahertz per second, gigahertz or above. That kind of spectrum, that kind of frequencies really allow us to do sort of, sort of uh, this tremendous bandwidth in that type of frequencies. And so you see us moving towards 5G and millimeter wave very quickly as we deploy 5G at a scale globally. This also means that latency is going to be reduced. We're talking about one to two millisecond latency for 5G. And now when you marry that with edge compute um, and really trying to put GPUs and other high performance compute at the edge, then you're looking at round speed, round trip type of comp uh, compute and processing of something like maybe 10 to 20 milliseconds. Now compare that with 100 to 200 milliseconds that you'll basically get today and that really trying to drive a paradigm shift in the type of application you can run. Now some of these applications are pretty obvious. Um, autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles can never be scalable and mainstream without really the advent of 5G and edge compute, without that real-time network. Now, to, to be able to collapse and process data across multiple cars and do it right in real time to avoid crash, to you know, manage the traffic, you need that real-time network. All the way to autonomous drones. We started the trial autonomous drones without a captain um, and with video capability that can help us. We were talking about AI earlier today. Jim was having a, um, a session on AI. Well, we're applying AI in the network today in the network. And one place we're applying it, we are feeding drones with visual capabilities to go up and tell us whether our cells have a problem or not. Whether it's dirt, one of the number one problem with all cell sites is dirt. Okay, basically to tell us whether we need to maintain the cell site or not. Now remember, we have 75, just us, we have about 75, 80,000 macro cells, and that's gonna be hundreds of thousands of small cells as you go to 5G. 5G is a paradigm shift from these macro big cells to very small cells that you can pretty much position every mile or two. So an explosion in the type of um, applications. So what does this mean to, what we've done over the past few years as we've brought to this, to this level is that we've gone to software. We are now a big advocate of software. We use a lot of software. Actually in at and we counted in the past two years, we have um, contributed 10 million lines of software just in two years, which is quite ast ast astonishing for a company, certainly uh, like at and which is a very traditional telecom communication company. These are the softwares we're starting to use today in building 5G. And today I'm not gonna go into a lot of the details as to how and why, but I'll just give you a little glimpse of what's going on. If you're not familiar with some of those software, you're probably familiar with the um, OpenStack, this is what we use for cloud compute. 
um, you know, for um, a lot of our cloud compute technologies. And this is what we have deployed in our cloud um, um, zones at AT&T today. Airship is what we use for the management of, of these cloud services, and it's based on Kubernetes. Um, and then you get uh, Danos is something we announced um, uh, last year. And this is sort of think of it as your network operating system for white boxes. And this is something very vital to us because as we start thinking of the edge, the edge is not just some cloud zone sitting a few miles away. The edge could also be where your customer is, where your factory is, where your retail store is. So we're starting to deploy a lot of these uh, white boxes with a network operating system uh, uh, called Danos here. ORAN, you're going to hear a lot of, about ORAN. So ORAN is a well-defined uh, foundation. Uh, it's led by a number of operators, and a number of vendors are part of that. And the goal of ORAN is to uh, really to disaggregate the RAN and drive interoperability. You'll hear more about that in the next month or so. Acrano is, a, is one of those capabilities we're using in building the edge for us as AT&T. We found that with one of our most challenging um, um, tasks, AT&T, when we are building these multiple edge zones, is integrating the technologies. So Crano is about how do you basically drive and, and, and uh, the integration of edge technologies uh, in a way that we could sort of test and deploy um, as a cookie cutter. Acumus, it's part of the Linux Foundation Deep Learning Umbrella. We're using Acumus in building analytic and predictive capability for the edge in figuring out how we can load balance our traffic. So when we load balance our traffic, video traffic and others, we have to have the predictive capability to allow us to know which cell, which carrier do you basically load balance your traffic. And this is basically what we use. We use AI capability and Acumus to do exactly that. And ONAP is our network operating system for the network cloud. All of these capabilities is what we're using today as we are rolling out 5G. I thought I'll show you this slide, and you're going to see more about the slides moving forward. Um, one of the most, if you want to work on a complex task, the big complex task to work on is the RAM. This is really probably, I've worked on a lot of software and open source. I've never worked on something as complex as the RAM. And part of that, because it's really a closed box, it requires a lot of expertise in data and radio engineering and, and many other expertise that, you know, it's hard to find one person who has all of these expertise together. And what we've been doing as part of the ORAN uh, consortium is to really uh, break down the RAN into smaller pieces. Uh, you'll see basically at the bottom is your radio unit. This is the little device that you see on top of the tower. And today, that little device is completely connected to a one big box called the BBU. And what we're doing here is that opening up the box into smaller software modules with open API interoperability and standardizing those APIs. And you can see where we're using the open source across all of these, um, across that basically stack. What's phenomenal in here is latency. Latency is very, very important. When we've been working in ONAP, you know, operating at about, doing a closed loop in the order of a second to two seconds, or even higher, it's okay in the network. You know, if you want to identify there's a failure in your virtual machine, or you want to drive traffic from one place to another, or apply a different policy, it is okay if you're operating at a half second or a second or more. But when you are looking at access, um, really you're now talking about 10 to 20 milliseconds for thing, doing closed loop um, within the, the, the CU, and, and really in the sub millisecond when you're going all the way down to the radio units. So now, you know, the expertise that you have to have is more than software, it's more than data, is you really need to understand how to manage latency and speed. So this is just another view of looking at this, um, is we talk about, you know, at AT&T about this concept of edge to edge, and this is where we are basically, all that means is that we are placing the intelligence. There's no one physical location for edge. So when we talk about edge compute, we don't talk about one place. We really talk about many places that start with the device, uh, all the way to the customer premise, where we are deploying these white boxes, 
um, and could be in your home and could be in small enterprises. And then you have the cell towers of basically putting some of that intelligence in your cell towers. Like I said, we're going from macro cells to micro cells. This is the movement towards um, using these millimeter wave spectrum. And now um, also placing some of that intelligence in these edge clouds being in the data centers. So this is your COs, your national data centers, your regional data centers. And what we're doing with those is that we're starting to push the intelligence from not just the device itself, or what is today is just the device itself, and the core cloud, the third-party cloud. We're starting to redistribute that intelligence all across to get the optimal speed, latency, and experience, basically, that you want to support, the SLA that you want to support for the application. And then you have your private cloud and, and third-party cloud. And you could see where the open source software that we are placing across the, across the stack from edge to edge. One thing that we don't talk more a lot about, and Martin mentioned this in the previous talk, I know this is a software conference. We talk a lot about open source, okay? But really what's also just as exciting as software um, and is so important is the data. And the reason why data is important, because for us to optimize a new software in an intelligent way, it's really through data. And that's why AI is interesting, because it's all about really bringing data and software together to try to do something really magical. Um, so we talk about 5G. You hear a lot about 5G. But one thing I want you to get out of my talk is when people talk about 5G, everyone talk about latency and speed and new experiences and virtual reality and augmented reality and autonomous cars. This is all good, and this is all great. But I want you what to remember is that the data. And the question is that we're going to be, we're going to have an explosion of data with 5G. And one thing that's really exciting for a community like us here is that what are we going to do with this data? What kind of new projects we can have in Linux Foundation by marrying the data with software? Um, I want to show you, uh, I want to show you a, a video here that tells you a little about how we are starting to think about using AI and data in our development of 5G. Oops. Can you play the video, please? At AT&T, we're no stranger to artificial intelligence and machine learning. We've embraced these technologies as valuable tools in our ever-evolving toolbox and are leading the way in integrating them into our world. Our next use? 5G. First, AI will help us build out our 5G infrastructure. It maps out where cell towers, fiber lines, and other transmitters exist today and can pinpoint the best location for 5G buildouts. Pairing location and usage information will create the most optimal 5G network. Machine learning and AI will work together to keep the 5G network maintained and secure by continuously monitoring how it's being used and how it's responding. So, if one cell is not functioning properly, AI will signal another tower to pick up the slack. Or, if one area is experiencing a high volume of usage, AI will trigger lower used cell sites to ensure speed isn't compromised. So what does this mean for you? An explosion of data. A strong, efficient 5G network built for a mobile workforce. A world of autonomous vehicles near zero lag virtual and augmented reality experiences from across the globe, and truly extraordinary possibilities. So we're actually using open source software today in designing our 5G. So this is an actual use case, is that every small cell AT&T puts is not based on an army of engineers going out and figuring out what to do and talking to the town, et cetera. It's really based on machine learning and AI technology that really ingests a large amount of data um, and tells us basically where is the most likely place we can put a small cell and what the experience is, what the throughput is, and how this is going to impact our customers. Um, another use case that you saw in the video is that now you put these small cells in, how do you make sure you load balance those cells, the traffic across those cells? Because for those who understand 5G and small cells, one of the challenges with small cells and 5G is the propagation is that you have very short propagation. And you have issues about penetrating through walls and glasses and things like that. 
So again, optimizing that, um, again, the same type of problem is that we're applying some of the open source technologies that I mentioned earlier and really building more data-driven type of predictors to tell us how do you position um, the antenna and what angle you can position the antenna to get the best experience. Okay, so I mentioned this. I'll just finish with those two use cases. Um, we're really very, very excited about this new paradigm shift with 5G. And it's really not about 5G. It's about bringing 5G and Edge together into this you know, real-time network. It's about bringing AI um, and pushing AI, not in the traditional AI, but really pushing AI closer and closer to the customer. So at their fingertips, they have really that intelligence, that compute, that power to do a lot of things with it wherever basically they are. It's really about making the network programmable. And that's what software-defined network is. If the network is not programmable, it's really very hard. You can have all the speed that you want. It's really very hard to change things you know, in, 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 a, in a millisecond type of interval, um, to change spectrum in a millisecond interval, to change the bandwidth that you would need in a millisecond type of interval. Um, so we're applying all of these. Um, we have actually opened up uh, several foundries in the United States and one in Israel and one in Mexico. And we've, we've, we've opened up sort of um, um, a 5G and an edge that uses some of these open source software in these foundries to allow us to prototype with small businesses and large businesses new concepts in 5G. So if you want to um, try something, you want to test something, you, you have an idea in open source or some new software, come and work with us in our foundries, whether it's for the autonomous cars, and we're working with a number of car manufacturers where we are really pushing that intelligence to the small cell and to manage uh, a number of cars sort of moving at the same time, all even re, you know, redefining the retail uh, of being able to monitor manufacturing and really change um, the conveyor belts in manufacturing based on the point of sale at that moment in time using uh, 5G technologies. So let me finish here, and um, thanks very much for listening, and look forward to working with everyone here.